So, Absolutely. Nitra, what what have you been up to? What have you been playing? I know we're uh, running a little up? bit later than usual, but I'm more than happy to have the podcast go on a little bit longer. Uh, you want the full list? Because I could go on for a while. We'll be here until 3 in the morning my time. <laughs> but, uh, well, I think what I'm, uh, one of the things I set out to do in 2020 was kind of scale back from multiplayer because I said to myself, look, I have all these amazing single player games that I've really wanted to play for a long time. And topically, what I really wanted to play was Outer Worlds, which I did not get when it came out because at the time I was going through a massive work crunch and it just seemed like a really bad idea to get invested in, in a big obsidian RPG. And I love it. It's basically New Vegas, but more polished, more balanced, fewer characters who are all wonderful. And I, I mentioned this earlier. It's basically, it's, it's like if Amazon had just a bit of a sense of humor. That's what, that's what I love about it. It's so topical and so relevant. And I think Obsidian has just done such a brilliant job with it. I think one of my favorite parts about, um, about Outer Worlds is that, uh, it's it's on a smaller scale. It's not a giant open yeah. world. They're kind of like, I, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's like maybe four or five like tiny open worlds, like like more of hubs than anything. So it's yeah. like really nice and tight and concise. Mm-hmm. Like it's dense. There's there's something around every corner versus just like a bit of a empty landscape. Yeah, exactly. I draw a comparison to the Yakuza series where it's a very small world, but it feels very big because it's very deep. And there's a lot going on in all of the section, in all of the areas where you can go and where you can traverse. And it also helps that the other thing that I really like about it is that all of your, you have six, I'm not sure, have all of you played Outer Worlds? I have. Uh, I'm very thankful that Xbox made it a Game Pass exclusive. Same, because, because actually, they bought because, them. Because I am not a Fallout person. I just, I don't like Fallout. I've never been into it. The whole dead-eyed stare always freaks the fuck out of out of me. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, yeah. "Hello, traveler, please help save my child." And I'm like, "No, thanks." Oh, that yeah. is too you accurate. Probably hate them. <laughs> like it literally like it makes you wish for shit. a nuclear winter. Yeah, I like it freaks out, out of me. So it's like I was glad that they made it on Game Pass because I was able to download it, and I think I played it for like six or seven hours, and I had fun with it. But I feel like I only had fun with it because it was free. <laughs> like, I don't need to pay I yeah, the other, the other thing I like about it is that you have you have six other um, characters you can recruit, mm-hmm. and what I like about them is that there are fewer characters, so there's more development given to each of them. But they're all just really pleasant people, and I've mentioned this a couple of times. Absolutely, the, I feel like I a big you- problem in the games writing is that uh, there's that the, people tend to confuse being a complicated character with just being a jackass, <laughs> and. Just I mean, to be, f- to be yeah, fair, I, I I would not use the word pleasant to describe. Uh, what's the guy's name? Vicar. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, Vicar. Yeah, I forget his <laughs> yeah, name. He's, he's he's pretty. I would I would say the one that that, that that's like, it's a bit of a stretch is um mm-hmm. Ellie. Yeah, I mean, even the people <laughs> who are not as pleasant as Parvati, yeah. who I love her, she's yeah. just in my party all the time. I mean, I will say that that game gave us an actual. Uh, I love Neoka. Sexual character, which as which as a fellow ace, definitely felt really good to have that representation. Yeah, definitely. So, I appreciated that. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even the people who are a little jerky in your party, they have like Freudian excuses for why they act that way, and they don't just they don't just choose scenery and just act like raw raw. Look at how deep and complex I am when I'm just being a jerk to everyone I meet. They're not like that. They're a little abrasive. But they act like human beings, mm-hmm. and by the way, and that is one thing I've noticed is that the, the the creepy Fallout stare that's much much better than it was, especially Oblivion. I can't play Oblivion because especially <laughs> when they zoom in on everybody's faces, it's like they're trying to eat my soul. I can't play that game. I remember seeing videos back in the day. Um, one of my friends would send me. Uh, What's the name of the annoying, the the adoring fan? We just like sprint up to you and just like dead staring you in the face. I'm like, oh, that's funny that that one character does that, and then no, he claims like, everybody. no, that's that's everyone. Yeah, that makes me kind of why and kind of kind of off topic, kind of worried about that. Uh, what the hell was that star game that Todd Howard? I, I know it. Yeah, kind of worried yeah. me about 
Starfield because it's like, oh god, now now I don't need like alien races giving me dead eyed stares as they're like, please save my space colony, and I'm like, no. <laughs> I think. <laughs> um... <laughs> I think one of my favorite yeah, things about the Outer Worlds is actually how much you can avoid combat mm-hmm. by uh, by yeah. specking in the in the uh, dialogue oh, yeah. not trees the uh, dialogue skills, and a lot of them are. I mean, the entire game is just written so damn well. So just being able to talk your way out of these situations is just great, and I, I think it'd be a welcome change to most games if they were to implement these. So, I'm sorry. Was that sir? Uh, I remember for the amount of combat that I did, I avoided all combat, save for, like, one thing. <laughs> save for, like, one encounter that I, like, fucked up on. I was just like, oh, and I'm getting experience for not even killing people. It's, like, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's not like... The game doesn't steer you towards combat. It's really... There are multiple ways to get experience points. And if you want to complete, go completely Rambo, that's great. But there are so many ways to play the game. And, and I know that's that's a very common marketing tagline, but in this case, it really is true. Oh, I think we just lost... Whoops. Oh, whoop. Oh. Stream, you are now Sarah. I am I am me and Nitro. I'm so sorry. I don't know what the fuck just happened. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, no. Okay. I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am staring at myself twice, and it is wow. kind of freaky. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so sorry. You know what? Just like, put a picture of Blitz on the screen. That'll be who I am for this, in, for this entire All podcast. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and fix this uh, Nitro. I'm going to go so ahead and sorry. just continue uh, on what you've been playing. Yeah, so uh, what else have I been playing here is Hades, actually. And, you know, I, I literally just started playing this maybe a couple of days before, just to give you an idea of where I stand with it. I've started playing it a couple of days before, uh, you know, we sat down here. I've already got 10 hours in the game. So it definitely gets my seal of approval. Combat is amazing. With It's pretty much exactly what I would expect from Super Giant, which is to say... Very enjoyable combat or gameplay just in general. Um, absolutely gorgeous art style. Uh, very punchy dialogue. That's always been something that that's appealed to me about Supergiant. And like a lot of, it's got a very pick up and play quality to it. That's that's what I like about Supergiant's games in general as well, where you can pretty much just drop in and immediately know what you're doing. But I'm not sure I would say Hades is my game of the year, but it's definitely in the top five. I. I admittedly haven't really clicked with any of their previous works. I think I played Transistor a bit because it was a PS Plus game, but just given kind of the critical goal, the uh, critical acclaim that um, Hades has been has been met with, I think I'll, I have so many other games on my backlog, but I'll get around to it eventually. I plus, have it, plus it helps that all the characters are hot. So oh god, yeah, I've I, yeah. I've always appreciated super giant games more for their storytelling. Yep. Than their gameplay, to be honest. I've played every Super Giant game. I've beaten every Super Giant game. <laughs> I just haven't done a full run on 80s yet. And honestly, I'm just not a big uh, roguelike person. So it's really hard yeah. for me. Yeah. But it's like, I I love their storytelling. I love how they do characters. I love their voice acting. Like, it's just everything else but the gameplay. I'm such a huge fucking fan of. Yeah. Like, and if it's, it, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, it's just like everything they do in their in their games makes them unique and makes them different. And to me that's such like a gaming thing for me, like just having them every release that they've done has been something different. And well, it's that's been the, interesting and it's been fun. <laughs> that's the thing about Hades and if it sets your mind at ease, it will they actually I was a little tentative as well. I'm not a huge roguelike fan myself, but they would so I was a little apprehensive going in, but not only is it, it's got that super giant charm, but they kind of weave the storytelling into the fact that it's a roguelike. So you may be pleasantly surprised at how they handle it. I don't want to give oh, too no. much away. So I've actually played it. I played it oh, right oh, when it came out on early access. Like I was okay. really early. Yeah, I bought it on day one when they announced it at the Game Awards. So I actually oh, played okay. it way so before they had like anything You passed. played it before me. Oh yeah, I played it before anything they had passed the Hydra. So like oh, I actually, okay. yeah, I played it like literally as soon as it released on early early access. So uh, I hate to be that I played it for everybody else person, but like I I was in it super early. I loved it super super early. I just haven't gotten a chance to like get around and sit down and play through the full game. Okay. Yet. All right. So. Nice. Let's see. You have you been playing? Uh, I guess I kind of know. You've been playing Smash lately, also, right? You, uh, yes, you, I've been playing a lot of that. 
You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think, you know, the great thing about Smash Ultimate is that I know this may be a bit of a contra- controversial take. I think it's the best entry in the series, hands down. And I know that might upset is, a lot of... Oh, go ahead. Is, is that a controversial take? Like, I know there's always going to be, like, diehard uh, Melee mm-hmm. fans, but... Um, I, I guess what what's kind of the perspective from the community on Ultimate, I guess? I guess the perspective is that some like really hardcore players don't like some of the features they've introduced, like the ability to short hop auto attack. Uh, they don't like the fact that it's faster, but not necessarily as flashy as melee. It's a lot of very technical complaints, which I personally don't understand because I think I love the fact that it's faster than Smash 4 and especially Brawl. I love the fact that it's very accessible now. I, and the fact that you can now do a lot of the more complicated moves more easily, like short hop into neutral air, att- air attacking or just doing short hop attacks in general, I think it broadens the tournament scene and makes it makes it much more accessible to more people. And I think that's something we've seen where, in conjunction with the fact that the Switch is a much more successful system than the Wii U, the competitive Smash scene seems to have expanded very significantly. I mean, even... Evo 2019 had, I think, 3,500 uh, people registered, which, yeah, not a huge number on its own, but for Smash, considering 10 years ago, the general consensus was, uh, with Smash was, oh, this is a party game. Why would you play this competitively? It, it's a big deal. Right. And I just think mm-hmm. the way this series has evolved is just amazing. So when you mainly play it nowadays, are you just kind of matching up against randoms? Are you doing... Uh, matches or what's your approach so i'm mostly playing it when i play I, I play it on stream a lot uh when i when i stream on twitch and what i usually do is well it sucks because we can't go to uh in-person weeklies right now because of covid but what i've done is basically you set you can set up an open arena and have people challenge you and what i often do and what most people who stream smash do is just have like a line of people to either challenge you directly or with some of the people who play me who who are a little newer to the game i'll kind of watch them fight each other and then i'll essentially be on commentary where i critique them say oh you should edge guard more you should shield more just things like that and i don't know if i mentioned this i uh, i have been a pikachu main in smash since 64. Uh, i've been very very happy with how that's turned out because pikachu was already pikachu's been pretty consistently top to high to top tier rank throughout the series and he was or it was massively buffed in the transition from smash 4 to ultimate to the point where it's arguably the best character in the entire game so i've been very happy about that with my Hmm. uh very limited knowledge of Hmm. the competitive scene for um for smash that can actually kind of surprise me to hear that pikachu's up there it's uh it's not it's not just it's just not clouded with uh foxes up up actually here let me look at the tier list. So in Smash 64, Pikachu is number one on the tier list, so he was considered the best in the game. Oh, wow. Uh, in Melee, he's considered ninth out of 26 on the tier list, which is like which is C tier, so yeah. he still gets a good... He still it's gets decent. tier, yeah. Yeah. In Brawl, he was ranked 8th out of 38th on the tier list. Uh, he still saw a decent amount of playtime. So Smash 4, he was considered 15th out of 55th poor jigglypuff uh on the tier list <laughs> and uh ultimate doesn't have an officially doesn't have an official tier list yet uh due from the smash back room mostly because of a changing meta game for all the dlc characters but uh, to your point fox has also done pretty well throughout the series although he was he was nerfed somewhat in the transition from four to ultimate but He's actually he's he's maintained pretty solid results. Uh, Light, who is in my state, he's the, he's tenth in the world right now. Mains Fox and does very well with him. Where does my boy Steven uh, fall on the tier list? No. General consensus is that he's mid to high tier. I think. Oh uh, wow. I mean, he's definitely not upper high tier or let alone top tier. Uh, he's got a little lot of good combo game, but his move set is incredibly janky, and. He's got a bit of RNG associated with mm. his damage output. That's always been a problem with certain characters. Yeah. So I think people appreciate him for the novelty. I'm not sure if he's going to make much of an impact when it comes to tournaments. Okay. Yeah. 
that is a lot of knowledge uh, for someone who uh, who plays with items. Yeah, I. <laughs> it's it's funny because the I, I I always like to keep it in mind, and I tell other people who play the game competitively. When I say I'm ninety nine better than ninety nine percent of people who play Smash, that's not the smug snarking that it sounds like. I'm saying that in the context of the uh, overwhelming yeah. people who play Smash play it as a casual party game, and and I also say that I consider myself above average competitively at best. But yeah, so I'm, the competitive scene is tiny, but it, it's growing. So. And especially without Nintendo's assistance, so so I think that's pretty laudable. I think my general issue with with most games, and especially Smash, was I'm easily the best person in my friend group, and so it's no fun playing against any of my friends. But I'm not good enough mm-hmm. to go to tournaments and win, even though I won one at my uh, at my high school um, back in like 2011 or something. But yeah, I'm not that good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's so funny because. I'm now at a point where, I mean, I basically, I spend, I'm as good as I am, relatively speaking, because I basically spent every non-COVID Sunday getting this shit kicked out of me by the top players in New England. So I can go to really casual tournaments, and I'll pretty much sweep the entire winner's bracket. And like I said, I, 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 try, to say, I try to keep it in mind that I'm not necessarily good. I'm just sort of a big fish in a small pond at that point. Right. And it's funny because now I almost can't play the game casually. Like when I sit down and play with my <laughs> friends with items on, I immediately go into like these immaculate Pikachu combos that I spent days and days mastering. And everyone else would just be like, Nitro, calm down. It's <laughs> like it, I have to it, turn it off. Has it yeah. ruined it? Uh, has it ruined like casual play for you whatsoever? Or Not Is really. I, I, I just have to make sure i had to, i just have to keep it in check sometimes mm-hmm. that look w- all stages are legal items are on just relax and have a little fun do you have a casual character i probably still use pikachu even mm-hmm. as my casual character just like because... for me <laughs> my problem was always and every time i try to start doing a casual character i ended up like oh really that works oh let me try <laughs> let me practice the-. and then they stop being a casual character yeah <laughs> that's immediately problem. <laughs> I don't think I ever even really had a main. Like I would have like certain characters I'm pretty good with. But, like if I'm playing with friends, I just stick myself on random and just deal with whoever I get. That, yeah, that's, that's probably a very bad way to get good. I mean, on one hand it is, but on the other hand you get a you get a ton of different experience with Yeah, you learn how to play the video game, which is very yeah, good. Exactly. Like, a lot of people learn how to play the character and then learn how to play the video game. You can if you learn how to play the video game first, you can go much further far, faster. I need, and what's the uh, Mr. Miyagi steps? You have to wax the car, <laughs> mop, yeah. mop the floor. <laughs> uh, let's see, what else have you been up to? No, me? Yes, you, Ooh. Pikachu. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, I played this earlier in the year. I don't know if anyone else has played Black Mesa. I have. Okay, so I pretty much went into Black Mesa totally blind. I played Half Life Two. I've played the episodes. I've played Alex. I had never played the original Half Life before, so bear that in mind. I started with two. You saved yourself and a lot of trouble, my friend. So I've been told because you know when I I mean I was very impressed with what they did with Black Mesa, but it wasn't until I installed the original game on Steam just as a point of comparison that I realized, holy crap! And then. I kind of played them side by side, and it wasn't it wasn't until I got to Zen that was when I realized now I know what they spent the majority of their time on because they basically turned what I understand is the most hated section of the entire game into one that I, I know I still New Zen got still kind of a and by comparison reception from what I understand I thought it was great but but what they did with it is just nothing short of jaw dropping. I think uh, New Zen is definitely a gigantic step up from uh, from original Zen, but that being said, it's not it's still not my favorite part of the game. Yeah, it's definitely. I have issues with it. It's a little disorienting. I had to confront a couple of walkthroughs just to get a sense of where I was supposed to be going, and it lacks some. the every, The entire game up until Zen feels very tight, and it feels very um, well defined in terms of where you need to go and. 
it's a little disorienting when you get to Zen, but it's leagues better than the original. I, I fully stand behind that. I think every little detail they put, because like there's even some levels that they kind of omit in Black Mesa instead of just like redesigning around them. There, there's actually one specific point that pit, that will always consistently piss me off in the original release was. Um, do you recall the little sniper hideout and there's like a bunch of mines everywhere? Oh god, yes, I remember and, that. And, in the original game, you can't see the mines, you can't see the snipers, and so you're, you're trying to like just rapidly jump across this minefield without knowing like what's going to happen. Uh, so that game, at that point, the, ba the game basically devolves into I need an F5 to quick save every every two seconds. Yeah. And uh, just being able to see the mines in the remake. Thank you. Yeah, that just a lot. The remake, it's. I mean, I know it's kind of controversial to list remakes as game of the year potential. We see that with FF7 remake, but for me personally, it, it, it's got potential for game of the year for me personally. I mean, it came out this year anyway, officially. I think they were working on the last part of Zen for I want to say like a year and a half. Yeah, it, it shows. It's what they've done with it is amazing. I, I think at this point, I think even one of the developer the one of the original developers for the original Half Life came out and said like, "Yeah, you don't have to play original Half Life anymore. Just play this." I remember this. this. Yeah. Uh, here, let me see if I can find the exact quote. God, I really need to go yeah. back and play it. Here, so Dario Cas Casali, I think that's I'm pronouncing that correctly, a designer at Valve who has worked on all Half Life games. Remarked in an interview that during development on Half-Life Alex, he attempted to play the entirety of the original Half-Life again for research, but after five hours decided to play Black Mesa instead, reasoning it was a much more enjoyable product. <laughs> That's great. That's beautiful. <laughs> Interesting. Let's see. What time is it? It's nine. We, we can go mm -hmm. on for a bit longer. Sarah, do you, do you have a cutoff time for tonight? Uh... Probably before ten because I am kind of sleepy. <laughs> uh, okay. It's, it's also midnight wanna, here. I also want to. I also want to make a. I also want to make a run. And you know that means we got an hour left. Okay. Let's see. Uh, do you want to go through the rest of your stuff real quick, then Nitro? That way, Sarah can want... talk about the snacks of the bug variety. Yay. Yeah. So, what else was on here that I completed? Oh yeah, I finally played Yakuza Kiwami this year. And, yeah, I mean, I know we've talked about this series so much, and it's just, it was like, the last Yakuza I played was 4, and that was a while ago. I played 3, absolutely adored it, played 4, absolutely adored it. I'm not sure why I missed 5 or 6, I couldn't even tell you, but they're definitely on the list. But I figured a good place to start was Kiwami, and it was like coming home. I mean, I know that, you know, Kamurocho is like the same as it's always been. And I just, I, you know, meeting Kiryu again, meeting Majima again, especially Majima, I will never get tired of him. I think, uh, um, I know the, the series goes in like a couple different cities for some others. I know like five has five completely different cities you go in. Yeah. Honestly, I think my favorite, I just like Kamurocho. I, I have no issue with the game just mm. recycling the same place. Maybe yeah. that's why I like four so much compared to five. Well, I think part of it for me also, and maybe it's because I haven't played the series, hadn't played the series since four. It's not like you know the game. Yeah, Yaku Yakuza doesn't release often enough to really need any kind of innovation. It doesn't really get stale. It doesn't feel boring or tiring in any way. And it's also helped by the fact that it, the stories in the games get a little crazy sometimes, but for the most part, especially in Kiwami, I always had a pretty good idea of where I was going, what I was doing. And can we talk about Majima everywhere for a minute? Because yes. that was such a great inclusion. I actually, you know what? I just remembered one thing I completely forgot to mention earlier when you said um, the uh, development studio behind it just has like such a lockdown on production schedules. And I think so much of that is that they're able to prioritize like what's important in the game. Like, yes, let's make our main characters look good. Let's refine the combat system. And like, yeah, admittedly, there's like some PS2 looking potato faces on random NPCs. But... If if that's what we have to deal with in order to get people working like normal hours, I'm fine with that. Yeah, agreed. One thing I just I will never get tired of, and I mentioned this in SDGC as well, is that 
I love the fact that none of Majima's soldiers are ever bothered by anything he does anymore. <laughs> it's like, hey, the boss is dressing up as a club hostess and he's making us act like zombies. Is it Tuesday? <laughs> like, to them, it's just another day at the office at this point. Isn't there a scene in um, in Yakuza 4... I think, like, even the all the citizens of Kamurocho are just like, yeah, Majima just exists, just roll with it. Where he floods the entire city with, like, his freaking, um, the Majima family members. They just flood the entire streets. Like, yeah. there's no traffic. And no one even brings it up. Just like, well, that was weird. Yeah, and like, even that that's, that appears during Saijima. I think this is how you pronounce his name. Saijima story arc. And even he just looks at it like, hmm, oh, cool. Like, he's not surprised <laughs> at all. <laughs> But then I think everyone at this point at in Kamurocho is just so used to everything. Like, if you, I don't know if, maybe it was just me. I could have sworn that there, are, I'm pretty sure you can see cops in the background when Kiryu is beating the shit out of random people on the street. I think you can. They just, they just don't care. Yeah. They're just <laughs> like, hey, we're on duty in Kamurocho. Who cares? Then again, this is the same series where it has the like central plot point of Kiryu's, Kiryu doesn't kill people. He's like Batman. Meanwhile, you can take a samurai sword and shove it through someone's gut and shoot him in the face with a gun. But he doesn't kill people. I still remember Injustice 2, where we were talking about fighting games. That's one of the few non-Smash fighting games I've clicked with. And there's this point where Damian Wayne um, says to Batman after he beats the living crap out of two henchmen... He says, so you won't kill people, but you're fine with traumatic brain injuries. <laughs> and Batman just walked away. And I'm like, um, Batman, that, that's a legitimate point. Batman's not killing people. He's just shooting a giant rubber shell from his tank Batmobile into someone's face. He's not killing yeah. them. They're he's fine. not running them over. He's zapping them. He's, he's pushing them out of the way. Yeah, I just wanted to call, like, Batman, can we get an answer for that, please? That's a good question. <laughs> Oh, jeez. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad you, you've had a good time with uh, Kiwami. Yeah, have it you, was have, it's amazing. Have you played them in order? Or where did you... So you started with the original one. Well, oh, no, was, I actually... Go ahead. I'm, oh, no, I'm sorry, you good. I was just going to say that. So, believe it or not, my first one was three. I reviewed that. I loved it at the time. And then I played four, I, which I also reviewed. And then I kind of fell out with the series without even meaning to. It wasn't really conscious. But then I also just, I yeah, again, like I said, this year I've been revisiting games that I had been meaning to play for a while. Kiwami was one of them. And now I've installed, the one regret that I have, um, after I, when I played Kiwami, I also played the original uh, PS2 Yakuza just for the comparison, which was interesting to say the least. And then the only slight regret I have, now that I'm playing Yakuza 0, is Nishiki's comments about how he'd never betray Kiryu are depressing now. <laughs> like, if, if you play 0 with that knowledge, you're just like, oh, this is a ticking time bomb. This is a yeah. <laughs> and I know the fan base is kind of divided. Some people say that you should start with Kiwami to get the, like, you know, the official experience of playing the games in order, so to speak. Others just say play from you know zero to one to to two to what whatever. It's it's like the Star Wars movies debate. Yeah, it's weird that the new Star Wars trilogy only had like two movies. They never made a third one. That's that's weird. <laughs> oh, boy, no, nah. that, that's a whole other thing. Mason knows my thoughts on it very very well. I I'm saying it was worth it for the audience. Lot. It was worth it for the audience, for my audience at least. <laughs> I got to live with my audience. It was beautiful. Uh, so what else have you been up to, Nitro? You're a man of many games. Yes, I. if you want, I could go through the full list of games that I've played this year. Uh, you're going to get some... Or the full list of games that I've completed this year. You're going to see some surprising ones on here. Uh, we, we can go through a couple real quick. I know Sarah is, is vehemently wanting to discuss her bug snacks. Yeah, so... Okay, so since we're here, you know what? I, what I, I don't want to take any more time away from Sarah so she can talk about bug snacks, but let's quickly discuss. I finally played finished Titanfall 2 this year, and you, holy crap, what was I waiting for? <laughs> so good. It's fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the best it, shooters ever. Uh, it's just so amazing because I feel like one of the most influential, possibly the most well crafted, 
potential, what could have been one of the most influential shooters of all time came out and everyone was just like, eh. And that's, I mean, that's not the game's fault. Um, I, I, Seth, I know we've talked about this. The, the way the game was handled in terms of release was just shameful. There wasn't that much marketing. And then uh, mm-hmm. EA, the publisher behind it, they sandwiched the release dates. What was it? It was Battlefield, Titanfall, and then uh, Call of Duty, which, you know, and between then, those two behemoths, yeah. like, yeah. no one bought it. Yeah. It, and then on top of it, I'm pretty sure that was the same month as Last Guardian and Final Fantasy 15. Exactly. Which I just don't know what. Okay, look, and I get that those are very different genres, but for people who are more who are kind of gaming connoisseurs who will play anything that's just taking that's just giving that's just taking away from your potential audience share so much releasing a game during that kind of blitz especially when all those properties are very well established versus titanfall which was the little fish in that pond yeah it's weird because titanfall originally that was one of those games in the early 2010s that the, the hype juggernaut for Titan, the original Titanfall was absolutely ridiculous. I remember it. And then it came out, and I feel like nobody ever heard of, nobody ever played it again. It's, I mean, uh, the original release was only uh, multiplayer, so I didn't play it. Actually, no. I got it for PC, like, I want to say 2014. It came out 2013. But yeah, it was it was decent enough, but it wasn't until Titanfall 2 where they where you really get to use that platforming, like in the context of a campaign, with specifically yeah. designed levels for that, which is like, this is amazing. Yeah, mm. and it was an amazing campaign. Like, I, I mean, I know people said the characters were flat, but the characters, I felt like, it's the it's the Mario Odyssey syndrome, where the characters are just sort of a vehicle to explore the gameplay, and there was so much of that, and it was so beautifully orchestrated and crafted that I just, I went along with the story. I mean, I was fine with it, but the gameplay, I didn't want it to end. BT is a beautiful robot. Mm-hmm. I agree. All those thumbs up. Yeah. And um, maybe a slightly controversial opinion on it. I I don't want to say I don't enjoy the Titan combat. I just think the pilot, um, what, the, what they call just you as a foot soldier, I think that combat is just significantly better. Yeah, I mean, the, the Titan combat, it's fine, but when you're dashing about parkouring, wall jumping, you, you feel like Spider-Man by comparison. God, I, I'm i going to have to reinstall Titanfall 2 now. <laughs> yeah, it has that effect. <laughs> I mean, it is on Game Game Pass because EA has all their EA Play stuff on a True. Game Pass. Is, is this exactly. sponsored by Game Pass or something? Oh, it might as well be. It should be. Just, uh, Great Shadow Legends hit me up. What they did was they made a deal with EA Play. So now pretty much every EA title that's ever been on an Xbox console is on Game Pass now. Yeah. I'm just going to make a oh. tweet at Raid Shadow Legends at this point. <laughs> Let's see. Any other smaller, quick ones you want to go through real quick before we talk about snacking on bugs? Um, who else is... I mean, a bunch of these are... I mean, I mean, I could talk about Assassin's Creed. I could talk about... Oh, you know what I'm working on right now is Super Mario U Deluxe. I actually never finished that, and I'm finally getting to a point where I'm kind of close to completing it. That's one of those games where it never really got the love it deserved because it was on the Wii mm-hmm. U. So yeah. I'm glad to see it getting a second chance. Mm. But uh, I've, yeah, I never played, unfortunately. But from what I heard, everyone I've heard talk about it said it's the best 2D Mario game. Yeah, people kind of sleep on it because probably because it was on the Wii U. Yeah. Also, but... also because it was another new Super Mario Brothers. It was the fourth one that came out at that point in time. So I yeah, think that probably didn't enough, help it. I think it's good enough level design, but. I, it was just fatigue at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But there's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. It's a damn solid one of those games. It's basically, it's got that same, Nintendo has, it's got that quality where it's kind of like the Yakuza series where it's got the Nintendo commitment to quality where it's going to be mechanically amazing. Just even if you don't personally like that type of game. Yeah. It's just amazing how, like, obviously they already 
have that foundation there for how to design a Mario level, but Nintendo just has such a fundamental understanding of game design, how to introduce mechanics, how to introduce level progression. It's it's just fucking perfect. It is. And mm. and what they do and I love their commitment to keeping things fresh and interesting that that has bit them in the ass a few times at <laughs> Star Fox Zero, but for the most part I think it works out really well. Yeah, that wasn't really a platinum certified game by any stretch of the imagination. I will not apologize hey. for that pun. Hey, if they were more hey, if they were more involved, that game would have been better. That's all I'm gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. 